the Lockheed P-80 Shooting Star, later known as the F-80, was the first operational jet fighter utilized by the United States Army Air Forces. During World War II, they were indeed America's first successful turbojet-powered combat aircraft, and while they did not see combat during World War II, they did wind up seeing it during the Korean War. The Shooting Stars have a bit of a unique look about them, since they combine modern attributes that you see in jet fighters with World War II-style aircraft. They are very much a transitionary platform. They had a crew of one, a length of 34 feet 5 inches, a wingspan of 38 feet 9 inches, a height of 11 feet 3 inches, a gross weight of 12,200 pounds, and they were powered by a single Allison J33A35 centrifugal compressor turbojet, capable of delivering 4,600 pounds of force dry but with water injection that could be bumped up to 5,400 pounds of force. They had a maximum speed of 594 miles per hour at sea level, and had a service ceiling of 46,800 feet. They were armed with six 50 cal M3 Browning machine guns. They could also be equipped with eight 127 millimeter HVAR unguided rockets, or two 1,000-pound bombs. A unique for the time attribute about them was that they were the first operational jet fighter to have their engines buried in the fuselage. Other early jets, like the ME-262 and Gloucester Meteor, didn't do this, but it would set the stage for how many future jets would be designed. Lockheed had been the first American aircraft company to mess about with jets, working on their L-133 in 1939, which I discussed last week. But that aircraft was rejected because it was way too advanced. Developing it would have taken too long, and the Army Air Force was looking for planes that they could get a hold of, like, right now, not in five years. But it wasn't that they weren't interested in jets. They went with a different design from a different company, the Bell P-59 Era Comet, which first flew in October of 1942. But that aircraft did not perform very well at all. It was only slightly better than piston engine fighters. And though Bell tinkered around with it to try to improve things, they became swamped with other work for the war. So the Air Force transferred the project over to Lockheed, who they knew from the earlier proposal had already messed about with jets. It didn't progress very quickly until the discovery of the ME-262 in the spring of 1943. And intelligence reports show that the Germans were working on this aircraft, and it would demonstrate significant superiority over current piston engine planes. They felt that they would need a jet answer to this, especially if the 262 showed up in large numbers, and the British were willing to help out with this. They had also been working on jets quite a bit, and were much more far along than we were in America, on par with German development. They sent over documents and blueprints, and the general of the Army Air Force, Henry H. Arnold, believed that an airframe developed to accept the British-made Halford H-1B Goblin jet engine would provide superior performance that could match the new German jets. As such, Lockheed was tasked with designing an aircraft based on their own experience with working on the L-133. And Lockheed knew going into this they should probably make something that was, um, reasonable. Not the L-133. Something that they could get out very quickly, because that's exactly what the army was looking for. They wanted something right now, today, which was also very unreasonable, but the point is, they didn't have time to tinker about with something a little crazy. They needed to make something that could work right then and there. Concepts on the XP-80 started in May of 1943. They hadn't received the British turbojet at that point, but Lockheed did obtain its blueprint dimensions and simply developed the airframe around those dimensions so it would be able to accept the engine. The team consisted of 28 engineers, led by Clarence L. Kelly Johnson, they were pressed to develop a comparable jet to both British and German outings as quickly as possible. Kelly Johnson would wind up submitting a design proposal in mid-June, and promised that he could deliver a prototype ready for testing in just 150 days, which sounds insane, but he did it. The team, beginning June 26, 1943, produced the airframe 
ahead of schedule in just 143 days, and it was delivered to Moroc Army Airfield on November 16th. The whole project was top secret, like so top secret. There were 130 people in total working on the project in various capacities, but out of them, only five knew that they were developing a jet. And the British engineer who personally delivered the Hafford H1 engine was actually detained by the police because Lockheed officials couldn't vouch for him because it would violate the secrecy of the project. That British engineer had a rough go of it because, well, the engine he delivered also got destroyed immediately. By foreign object damage. When he dropped the engine off, he had warned them that the skin of the inlet ducts on their airframe was going to be too thin. But the American engineers ignored this advice, and when they powered the engine up to full throttle, both ducts collapsed, were sucked in, and shredded the engine. So that was, that was good. This, of course, delayed the first flight until a second engine could be received, and there was only one other in existence. The only reason this didn't set them back months is because de Havilland was kind enough to give them the only other engine they had, which they had intended for their prototype vampire. The inlet ducts were sufficiently modified and strengthened to avoid a repeat of the first tests, and the first prototype was nicknamed Lulubelle, which is just, just adorable. Her name was Lulubelle, guys. They also sometimes called her Green Hornet because of the paint scheme, but I prefer Lulubelle because it's way cuter. She first flew on January 8th, 1944, with Lockheed test pilot Milo Burcham at the controls. Kelly Johnson said it was a magnificent demonstration and that our plane was a success. And in following test flights, the prototype eventually reached a top speed of 502 miles per hour, making it the first turbojet-powered USAAF aircraft to exceed 500 miles per hour in level flight. But despite these early successes, developing the shooting star did not go smoothly in any way. Pilots transitioning from piston engine aircraft to jet found it unfamiliar. Jets did not behave in the same way, even down to just noise. When they flew at high speed, they were used to hearing a very loud reciprocating engine. But the shooting star didn't do this, and they had to retrain themselves to rely on the airspeed indicator rather than just sound cues. The second prototype, which was called the XP-80A, was designed to test out the General Electric I-40 engine. Two such prototypes with this engine were tested, but things didn't go well with them. Milo Burcham, who had enjoyed flying Lulubelle, found these new prototypes to be severely lacking in terms of power. The I-40s just weren't as good as the British-built H-1, and they were considered a bit disappointing, at least at first, though improvements would be made. There was also sufficient danger involved with testing these planes. As I said, pilots were not familiar with jets or the high speeds, and many accidents happened as a result of messing about with the shooting star. Bertram himself was killed on October 20th, 1944, in an accident while flying a YP-80A. Another accident happened on March 20th, 1945, though that time the pilot, Tony Levere, did escape. The top-scoring World War II USAAF ace, Major Richard Bong, was also killed on an acceptance flight of a production P-80 on August 6, 1945. He actually crashed for the same reason as Bertram, a main fuel pump failure. Bertram's death was a result of a failure to actually tell him about a newly installed emergency fuel pump backup system, which would have saved his life in his situation. But investigation of Bong's crash found that in his case, even though he had been told about it, he had forgotten to turn that pump on, which again would have prevented the accident. He had bailed out, but it was too close to the ground for his parachute to deploy. Bong's death was a significant blow to the program overall, and the USAAF and Lockheed wanted to prove the reliability of the airplane. Robert E. Thacker from the Flight Test Division at Wright Field was ordered to select three new pilots, get a hold of five P-80s from Lockheed, take them to Murak Army Air Base, and fly each of them for 500 hours to prove that these planes were in fact safe, and this was all just a string of bad luck. The three pilots that he got included Chuck Yeager, and they indeed put 500 hours on each airplane 
without any further incidents, showing that while the accidents had been tragic, it wasn't because the planes themselves were dangerous. The Shooting Star did begin to enter service in late 1944 before the end of World War II, but they never actually saw combat. There were a few stationed out in Italy, but delays in delivering the production aircraft meant that they would never see any action during the war. In truth, by the time they were ready, the war was basically over. The Mustangs were doing just fine, and even though the ME-262 did show up, they weren't in sufficient numbers to turn the tide of the war, and as such we just didn't need the Shooting Star, at least at the time. But they were still in service, and stayed that way even after the conflict. Several variants were messed about with, and on January 27th, 1946, Colonel William H. Council flew one of them non-stop across the United States to make the first transcontinental jet flight. He completed this in 4 hours, 13 minutes, and 26 seconds, at an average speed of 484 miles per hour. He was aided by the upper-level westerly winds, a modified P-80B prototype, meant to be a racer and designated P-80R, was piloted by Colonel Albert Boyd to obtain a world air speed record of 623.73 miles per hour on June 19, 1947. When production began on the latest iteration, the P-80C, in 1948, the newly formed United States Air Force redesignated them as F-80C. And the Navy did mess about with them, too, utilizing them mostly as trainers. The Navy actually loved them as training aircraft, and wound up procuring 698 of the T-33 Shooting Stars, which was the training variant of the Shooting Star. More on those later, however. But where the Shooting Star finally saw combat was in the Korean War. They were among the first aircraft to be involved in jet versus jet action. The Air Force by this point was using the F-80C variant. They also utilized the RF-80 photo recon version. And they flew both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground sorties, claiming multiple victories against North Korean Yak-9s and IL-10s. But those were both piston-engine aircraft, so the F-80s had a significant advantage. But then, um, they ran into what could be defined as a problem. The Soviet MiG-15 was an entirely different situation for the Shooting Star. Yeah, they were both jets, but the MiG-15 had two words. Swept wings. The MiG-15s incorporated German research that had showed that the swept wings delayed the onset of compressibility problems and enabled speeds that were much closer to the speed of sound. The MiGs were just straight up faster. And that was a problem for Shooting Star pilots. On November 1st, 1950, a MiG-15 pilot, Lieutenant Semyon F. Komenich, became the first pilot in history to be credited with a jet versus jet aerial kill after he said he shot down an F-80. But on the American side, they said the F-80 was taken down by Flack, not by him. One week later, on November 8th, an American pilot, Lieutenant Russell J. Brown, who was in an F-80, reported that he had shot down a MiG-15. The Soviets claim that there were no MiGs lost that day, and that their pilot survived by pulling out of the dive at low altitude. Okay, look, guys, guys, I know it's the Cold War, but... But either one or both of you are lying to me, and I hate it. Please, I, I don't know what's happening here. Come on! Regardless of all of this, it was obvious that the MiG-15s were technically superior to the Shooting Stars. But that didn't mean the Shooting Stars were going to go down without a fight. They managed to take down at least six MiG-15s on their own, but they were quickly replaced by the more modern F-86 Sabres, which had been rushed into service in order to deal with the MiGs. The Shooting Stars were then relegated to only ground attack missions, advanced flight training duties, as well as air defense over in Japan. By the end of hostilities, the only Shooting Stars that were still in Korea were the photo reconnaissance variants. The type would be officially retired in the United States in 1959, but that was only the fighter variant. Because as I mentioned earlier, there was also the T-33, the Shooting Star Trainer. The main difference between them and the regular Shooting Stars was that they had an extended fuselage to allow room for a second seat and set of instruments for an instructor. 
these aircraft not only were produced in much larger numbers, but lasted way longer than their fighter variant forebears. Versions of this aircraft would be kept in use for decades and wouldn't be completely withdrawn in America until 1997. That is an insane longevity. Because, simply put, while the shooting stars didn't stay relevant for long, well, the one thing they did have was stability. Their straight wings allowed for a very stable jet platform, and that made them good for training. They were lower speed jets too, so they were fantastic for getting a brand new pilot's feet wet when it came to controlling a jet aircraft. And 1997 was just for America. The Bolivian Air Force still used them as late as July of 2017. Other planes also spun off from Shooting Star development, including the F-94 Starfire. No, not that Starfire, this Starfire. But that aircraft's honestly its own story. In any event, the Shooting Star definitely made history, as the first operational jet fighter for America, and did a serviceable job despite being outclassed rather quickly. They have a special place in many a plane spotter's hearts, and there are a ton in preservation. I mean, so many. Seriously, there are a lot in preservation, including Lulubel, the very first XP-80. She's on display at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. The F-104 Starfighter is an American single-engine, supersonic air superiority fighter that was actually extensively deployed as a fighter-bomber during the Cold War. It saw service with many, many, many different nations, and is counted among one of the most popular Cold War era fighters due to its very distinctive design. The Starfighter is pretty easily recognizable due to a T-shaped tail, a very narrow, long fuselage that makes it look more like a rocket than a jet, and those wings, those tiny stubby baby wings. The specifications vary slightly depending on which exact model we're talking about, as there were also many versions of it, but its overall length was about 54 feet, 8 inches, with a wingspan of 21 feet, 9 inches, a height of 13 feet, 6 inches, an empty weight of 14,000 pounds, and a maximum takeoff weight of 29,027 pounds. By design, they were powered by General Electric J79 after burning turbojet engines and they were the first jet in service with any military that could sustain a maximum speed of Mach 2. They were impressive aircraft for their time, but they did have a lot of growing pains, to be frank. Though not as many as people seem to think, as there's a lot of misinformation surrounding the Starfighter due to an accident rate that was a bit higher than normal, as well as certain um, <clears throat> activities by Lockheed in the background. All this combined to make the Starfighter look like a dangerous plane for the pilot, when in reality, well, like I said, it wasn't perfect, but there weren't exactly death traps either. The development of the F-104 can be traced back to Clarence L. Kelly Johnson, who was the Vice President of Engineering and Research at Lockheed's Skunk Works, their super de duper top secret stuff. He visited U.S. Air Force bases in South Korea in November of 1951 to speak with the pilots about what they wanted and needed in a fighter aircraft, having now had experience flying against enemy MiGs. During the Korean War, American pilots first encountered the MiG-15, and at the time they were using the North American F-86 Sabres. Some of the pilots felt that the MiGs were actually superior the larger and comparatively more complex F-86s. They felt that they'd be much better off with a smaller and more simple aircraft that complemented those particular attributes with excellent performance, specifically high speed and high altitude capabilities. Johnson went back to Lockheed and started designing an aircraft based on these requests. In March of 1952, his team was put together and they wound up studying over 100 different configurations for the aircraft. Small and simple was definitely the go-to when it came to designing this thing. In order to achieve the performance they wanted, they would need to do that, and the pilots had said that they wanted that anyway. A single engine design seemed to be the logical step, and they wound up choosing the brand new at the time, General Electric J79 turbojet for this. 
Johnson will wind up taking his new fighter concept to the U.S. Air Force on November 5th, 1952. And they were interested enough to create a general operational requirement for a lightweight fighter. Three additional companies were also named finalists for this requirement. But Lockheed already had a head start since their design had inspired the concept in the first place. They were granted a development contract on March 12th, 1953 for two prototypes and they were designated the XF-104. Lockheed worked extremely fast and the mock-up was ready by the end of April. And with that approved, they started working on both prototypes. But they had an early hurdle in the fact that the J-79 engine was actually not ready yet. So the prototypes instead were built to use the Wright J-65 engine, which was a licensed constructed version of the Armstrong Siddeley Sapphire. The first prototype was finished at Lockheed's Burbank facility by early 1954, and the first flight took place on March 4th of that year. The total time from contract to first flight was less than a year, which is insanely fast for a military jet. Developing the F-104 was actually never really a secret, but the Air Force still kept certain things under wraps as best they could. Only a vague description was given when they first revealed that it existed, and no photographs of the aircraft were released to the public until 1956. And even at the public unveiling, the engine inlets were actually obscured with metal covers, and visible weapons, including the M61 Vulcan cannon, were also hidden. Early tests were promising, but not without their hiccups. The first flight, for example, only lasted 21 minutes due to a landing gear retraction problem. The second prototype was actually destroyed several weeks later during gun firing trials because the hatch to the ejector seat actually blew out, which depressurized the cockpit. The pilot thought that this had crippled the aircraft, though he actually could have landed it had he tried, so he wound up ejecting. Despite the mishaps by November 1st, 1955, the remaining prototype was accepted by the Air Force, and based on the testing, the next variant of the aircraft, dubbed the YF-104A, was lengthened and fitted with the finally ready J-79 engine. It was also given modified landing gear and modified air intakes. 17 of this new model were ordered by the Air Force on March 30th, 1955 for further tests and the first of them would fly on February 17th, 1956. Lockheed continued making improvements to the plane throughout the testing period, and the first production, F-104A, to enter service was delivered to the 83rd Fighter Interceptor Wing on January 28th, 1958. The F-104s were all metal, primarily duralumin, with some stainless steel and titanium for good measure. And the fuselage was two and a half times as long as the plane's wingspan. The wings were centered on the horizontal reference plane, but were located farther aft on the fuselage than most contemporary designs. The wings combined with the T-tail, combined with the speed of the plane, resulted in a um, quirky beast, shall we say. The Starfighter is not a bad plane, nor is it inherently dangerous in the right hands but they are definitely not as forgiving as many other planes would be, as we'll soon discuss. Their wings were extremely thin. In fact, the leading edges were so thin, only 0.016 of an inch, or 0.41 millimeters, that they were actually a hazard to ground crews. Protective guards had to be installed on them during maintenance, and that meant fuel tanks and landing gear had to be placed in the fuselage. Due to the thin wings, the landing speed on the F-104s was very, very high. So the designers had to develop a Boundary Layer Control System, or BLCS, which consisted of high-pressure bleed air, which was blown over the trailing edge flaps to lower the landing speeds to help make the process safer. Landing without BLCS engaged was only done in emergencies and was a terrifying experience, frankly. Due to their high T-shaped tails, the early ejection seats actually were downward firing, but so this presented a problem for low altitude escapes. In fact, 22 US Air Force pilots would fail to escape from their aircraft due to this problem. Later, they would be replaced with more conventional upward firing ejection seats that were powerful enough to clear the tail. And when it came to operating for the US Air Force, it was designed as an air superiority fighter, 
but the Air Force tended to use them as supersonic interceptors. Now, from a speed perspective, the F-104 would be great for that, but not from a range or armament perspective. They were small, so they couldn't carry very much, and they couldn't go very far but they could still do it well enough for the time. And the first taste of any kind of action took place during the Taiwan Strait Crisis of 1958. The 104s did not actually engage any enemy fighters during this time, but they did act as a solid deterrent. They would be deployed again during the Berlin Crisis of 1961, and again act as a deterrent, and they would also be involved in the Vietnam War. But they did plenty of missions, they actually never had any air-to-air -air kills. And the pilots in the F-104s, who definitely encountered MiGs, started getting the impression that um, the North Vietnamese just weren't engaging them on purpose. By that point, the North Vietnamese did know about the F-104s performance. So the running theory was that they were either told or just straight up refused to actually engage with the Starfighters. They'll find anything else. But not them. No, not that one. Absolutely not. No, no, no. Scary. But the 104s were fast. Really, really fast. And they would continue using them until July of 1967, when all the Starfighter units transitioned to McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom IIs instead. But the F-104 was hardly done being in service. Pakistan would get significant use out of them, as would Belgium, Canada, Denmark, Germany, Greece, Italy, Japan, Jordan, Netherlands, Norway, Spain, Taiwan, and Turkey. They were all over the world. But the one we're going to focus on for our purposes is West Germany, because that's where most of the problems, as well as stories about them, tend to crop up. The West German Luftwaffe did take plenty of F-104s, but they had a very high accident rate. And a few countries did have a slightly higher than average accident rate with them, and... Part of that's due to some early issues, another part of it is, well, we'll get to that in a second. For one thing, the 104s have very high wing loading, which is only made worse when they were carrying external stores. This fact may not be a surprise, given their wings barely exist, but during early stall tests, it was found that the aircraft really liked pitching up once it reached an angle of attack of about 15 degrees. That would result in a rapid increase in angle of attack, to approximately 60 degrees, accompanied by lateral and directional oscillation, which was followed by a sudden uncontrolled yaw and roll. By that point, the aircraft was just kind of out of control completely, so they had to have an automatic pitch control added to avoid this, as well as a stick shaker system to warn the pilot of an impending stall, and even if that was ignored, a stick pusher would force the aircraft to nose down to a safer angle of attack, although that was often overridden by the pilot, which was a bad call, but they did it. The T-tail also suffered flutter. Because the horizontal tail center of gravity was aft of both the bending and torsional axis of the vertical tail to which it was attached, it was actually highly vulnerable to flutter at transonic speeds. And if it got bad enough, it could cause the tail to separate entirely from the aircraft. They also had serious issues with the J-79 engine which would become good engines, but they were brand new, and they had a lot of teething problems. Engine failure wasn't unusual, and early F-104s didn't have modulated after burning, meaning that combat operations could only actually be performed at one of two settings, which was either maximum military power or full afterburner. To translate for those of you that don't know what that means, basically the pilots had two options, Mach 1 or Mach 2.2. Nothing else. Do you want to go fast or really, really fast? There's no in-between here. And the engines really like suffering from afterburner blowouts on takeoff, or sometimes even non-ignition, which would result in a major loss of thrust, and in that situation, it was recommended that they abandon the takeoff entirely. But all the problems I've listed so far really mostly have a lot to do with teething issues with the planes themselves that weren't that unusual for jets at the time. The issue with the Luftwaffe in particular, and why so many of their planes went down, seems to be, well, frankly, kind of a skill issue. I don't mean it as a dig, but it's twofold. For one thing, since the end of World War II, a lot of pilots that they had had settled into civilian work, and the F-104 was a far cry to the planes that they had been used to, if they had any experience at all. But that was kind of the other problem. So the U.S. Air Force was well aware that the F-104 was a quirky beast, and would require a skilled hand in order to handle them. 
As a result, Starfighter pilots had to have at least 1,500 flight hours of experience prior to even touching these planes. But in West Germany, the pilots only had around 400, and that was a sizable difference in terms of understanding how to deal with this plane's peculiar traits. Eric Brown, British Royal Navy officer and test pilot who flew more aircraft, 487 types, than anyone else in history, did fly the Starfighter, and he described it as a hot ship that has to be flown every inch of the way. Basically, what he said, while the F-104 was capable, you needed to baby it. The pilot had to be paying attention and had to be vigilant with what was going on. There really wasn't any downtime when you flew a Starfighter. Eric Hartman, who was this world's top scoring fighter ace, also flew the plane in West Germany, and he actually deemed it to be an unsafe aircraft with poor handling characteristics for aerial combat. Regardless of how you slice it, the F-104s were certainly capable, but they were very, very needy birds that needed your full, undivided attention, otherwise they could get you killed. And Lockheed themselves didn't help this portrayal of them, because the F-104 was caught up in Lockheed's bribery scandals that happened around that time. Long story short, it was found that Lockheed was actually bribing politicians in foreign countries to spend their country's tax dollars to buy Lockheed aircraft. Lockheed would make more money on the sales in the long run, and since it was coming from tax dollars, the politicians would be lining their pockets in these arrangements. Lockheed had indeed spent some money on bribes in West Germany to get the F-104s in the service, and that made it look like they were bribing the officials to look the other way with the safety issues, when in reality, no, they were just bribing them to buy them outright. It wasn't that they were using money to conceal the safety issues of the jet, they were just using the money to, to get more sales. It, it, it was still seedy, underhanded, and violently illegal, but it wasn't that they were paying them to buy a dangerous aircraft, necessarily. Because the F-104 wasn't really dangerous, you just had to know what you were dealing with. Its speed and power was way ahead of the curve, and a lot of pilots weren't ready for that. The German press even called them Widowmakers as a nickname, though if you ask the pilots, the most common nickname for them was Zipper. And despite the controversies, they remained in service in some capacities for many, many years. Italy, for example, wouldn't retire their last Starfighters until 2004, and they're actually still in use, just not in military format. A few of them remain in civilian operation, with a Florida-based company known as Starfighters Incorporated that uses them for contract testing and flight simulations. The 104 also laid the groundwork for another famous plane, the Lockheed U-2, which was basically the prototype of the Starfighter with really big wings on it. And they set several world records during their time. The Starfighter was the first aircraft to simultaneously hold both the world speed and altitude records. And their popularity certainly can't be understated. Yeah, they were definitely quirky. And yeah, there were definitely a lot of issues to overcome. And you certainly had to know what you were dealing with whenever you got in the cockpit of one of these things. But at the end of the day, let's be fair. They're really cool, you guys. The McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom II is an American tandem two-seat, twin-engine, all-weather, long-range, supersonic jet interceptor and fighter bomber that was originally developed for the United States Navy. They had a length of 63 feet, a wingspan of 38 feet 5 inches, an empty weight of 30,328 pounds, a max takeoff weight of 61,795 pounds, and they're powered by a pair of General Electric J79 GE17A afterburning turbojet engines. Those engines could push the F-4s to an astonishing Mach 2.23. And McDonnell Douglas likely never dreamed of how prevalent the F-4s would become. Not only did they see service in the Navy, but also the Air Force, the Marines, as well as numerous other countries. Over a dozen different variants of the F-4s would be produced, resulting in a total number built of 5,195 individual aircraft, thus rendering it the most produced American supersonic military aircraft ever. And while they weren't perfect, their legacy lasts until this very day. And they're definitely one of the most popular airplanes that has ever flown. 
The development of the F-4 can be traced back all the way to 1952, when the CEO of McDonnell Aircraft, Jim McDonnell, appointed Dave Lewis, who was the chief of aerodynamics, to be the company's new preliminary design manager. At the time, the company did not expect a new aircraft competition to be held by any of the United States military branches anytime soon, and they couldn't exactly sit around and just twiddle their thumbs in the meantime, so they ran an internal study that showed that the Navy would likely have the greatest need for a new type of aircraft, specifically an attack fighter. The next year, 1953, they began working on revising their pre-existing F-3H Demon naval fighter, looking to expand their capabilities and push for better performance out of them. They wound up creating a few different variants that generally involved switching out their engines, and one of which was powered by the General Electric J-79. That version promised a top speed of nearly Mach 2, and on September 19th, 1953, McDonald approached the Navy with a proposal for the, as they called it, Super Demon. The aircraft was supposed to be modular, so it could be fitted with one or two seat noses for different missions, and would have different nose cones to accommodate radar, photo cameras, cannons or rockets, in addition to the nine hard points that'd be under the wings and fuselage. The Navy was interested, and ordered a full-scale mock-up of what was designated the F-3H-GH, and while it was neat and all, they felt that the upcoming Grubbin XF9F9 and the Vought XF8U1 would already satisfy their need for a supersonic fighter, so they didn't want to push forward with the F-3H. McDonald didn't give up, though. They reworked it into an all-weather fighter-bomber, with 11 external hardpoints for weapons, and on October 18th of 1954, they did receive a letter of intent for two YAH-1 prototypes. Then on May 26, 1955, four Navy officers showed up at the McDonnell offices, and within an hour, presented them with an entirely new set of requirements. The Navy already had the Douglas A-4 Skyhawk for ground attack, as well as the F-8 Crusader for dogfighting. What they were looking for from McDonnell was an all-weather fleet defense interceptor. And as a result, McDonnell had to rework the design again, this time adding a second crewman, because it was believed that air combat in the next war, given all the new tools in the form of advanced radar that were available, would actually overwhelm solo pilots with information. This would ultimately lead to the XF-4H1 prototype, which was designed to carry four semi-recessed AAM N6 Sparrow 3 missiles, and it was powered by two J-79 GE-8s. It was similar to the McDonnell F-101 Voodoo, and indeed the F-4 definitely owes something in terms of certain design attributes to what was learned with both the Voodoo and the Demon. The prototype's engine sat low in the fuselage to maximize internal fuel capacity, as well as ingested air through fixed geometry intakes. The thin section wing had a leading edge sweep of 45 degrees, and it was equipped with blown flaps for better low speed handling. However, wind tunnel tests did reveal lateral instability. So to fix that, they added a 5 degree dihedral to the wings. And to avoid having to redesign the titanium central section of the aircraft, the engineers angled up only the outer portions of the wings by 12 degrees. The all-moving tailplane was given 23 degrees of anhedral control to improve performance at high angles of attack while still keeping the tailplane clear of the engine exhaust. The air intakes were also equipped with one fixed ramp and one variable geometry ramp to give maximum pressure recovery between Mach 1.4 and Mach 2.2 and the all-weather intercept capability was achieved with the AN-APQ-50 radar. On July 25th, 1955, the Navy ordered two XF-4H-1 test aircraft, as well as five YF-4H-1 pre-production examples of the planes, and it made its maiden flight on May 27th, 1958, with Robert C. Little at the controls. A hydraulic problem actually precluded the retraction of the landing gear, but the flights after that went much better. These early tests resulted in redesigning the air intakes, including the distinctive addition of 12,500 holes, which were meant to bleed off the slow-moving boundary layer air from the surface of each intake ramp. 
The series production aircraft also had splitter plates to divert the boundary layer away from the engine intakes. And the F-4 was soon in competition with the XF-8 U-3 Crusader III. Due to cockpit workload, the Navy actually wanted a two-seat aircraft. And on December 17, 1958, the F-4H was indeed declared the winner. However, delays with the J-79 GE-8 engines meant that the first production aircraft were fitted with J-79 GE-2 and 2A engines instead. But those were still very good engines, each being able to supply 16,100 pounds of force. In terms of the nickname for the craft, early proposals included both Mithras as well as Satan. No, seriously, someone thought they should call it Satan. But it was decided they should probably not go with something that might seriously offend someone, so they went with Phantom 2. Yes, most people would call the F-4 Phantom just Phantom, but it was actually the Phantom 2. The original McDonnell F-H Phantom was also a jet aircraft, and it was first flown during the end of World War II. The original F-4s with the weaker engines never actually saw combat. 45 of them were produced and they were designated F-4As. But the definitive version of the F-4s, the F-4Bs, first flew March 25th, 1961. And 649 of those were produced. They showed significant promise in terms of performance and their speed and power was impressive. Both the Navy and the Marine Corps began using them and eventually started the Air Force which was the result of Defense Secretary Robert McNamara, who was pushing to cut costs by convincing all military branches to use the same type of aircraft. This policy, while financially sensible, wasn't really achievable in the grand scheme of things, because each branch had very different requirements, but he was able to talk the Air Force into using the F-4, especially when an F-4B won Operation High Speed, which was a fly-off against a Corvair F-106 Delta Dart. Upon seeing their performance, the Air Force did decide to borrow two of the F-4Bs from the Navy in order to develop requirements for their own version. The Navy was focused at the time on air-to-air -air interception, but the U.S. Air Force was looking for a plane that can do both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground. The first Air Force Phantom, designated the F-4C, the first flew on May 27, 1963 and exceeded Mach 2 on its maiden flight. The F-4 platform proved to be very flexible, with modifications that could indeed handle the requirements of all the branches fairly well, and subsequent changes only improved them more. They actually set multiple world records. Five of their speed records remained unbeaten until the F-15 Eagle appeared in 1975. They're also the only fighter that's been flown by both the Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels, the Air Force and Navy's, respectively, flight demonstration teams. Indeed, the F-4 showed great promise, and all the services were pretty happy with them. But their true test came in the Vietnam War. Now, it goes without saying that the Vietnam War was kind of a total mess from pretty much every angle. There's no question about that. And going into the detail about the conflict would take an insanely long time because it was way more complicated than most people think. But when it comes to the F-4 in particular, well, both the U.S. Air Force and the Navy had very high expectations of the Phantom going in. They assumed that its access to the latest hardware in terms of firepower, the best available onboard radar money could buy, as well as the highest speed and acceleration properties of any military aircraft they had, combined with new tactics they developed over the years, would provide them a major advantage over Russian MiGs that the Viet Cong were using. But things didn't go quite as smoothly as they had thought. The Soviet planes weren't exactly pushovers, particularly involving the MiG-21. The fish beds were smaller and less powerful than the F-4s, but they were very agile. A skilled fish bed pilot could outmaneuver a Phantom, and over the course of the war, F-4 pilots were credited with about 150 MiG kills, but at a cost of 42 Phantoms. That does sound like the F-4s won in the end, which, I mean, Yes, but also that was way higher than they thought. And the performance showed that the Soviet aircraft probably shouldn't be underestimated going forward. And it would lead both the Air Force and the Navy to push for further fighter development, culminating in the F-15 and the F-14, respectively. But the F-4 was still well-liked either way. They had done well, just not as well as everybody had hoped. And they would remain in service for a significant amount of time, even after Vietnam. 
A few were even used in Operation Desert Storm as wild weasel aircraft, which is a code name that's given by the US Air Force to an aircraft of any type that's equipped with anti-radiation missiles and tasked with the suppression of enemy air defenses. That role in particular is actually commonly associated with the F-4s. They were good at it. Really good at it. But nothing lasts forever, and eventually the F-4s would have to be retired sometime. After all, they were first introduced in 1960, and the last of them was withdrawn from combat use, at least as far as the United States was concerned, in 1996, though admittedly we did still keep them around for use as target drones until 2016. A lot of other countries still use the F-4. Japan, for example, wouldn't retire theirs till 2021, and Iran still uses theirs as far as anyone seems to know, but the last time it was confirmed was 2014, when they did conduct airstrikes, actually, against ISIS targets. The Phantoms also saw use by Australia, Egypt, Germany, Greece, South Korea, Spain, Turkey, the UK, just to name a few. They were an insanely prevalent aircraft, and it was probably because they were flexible. Yeah, their maneuverability in a dogfight wasn't exactly superior, but admittedly, they were designed as an interceptor. They're meant to kill you before you get to the dogfight part, you know? Plus, they were great at air to ground, and they became legendary for their performance as wild weasels. They're actually one of my favorite airplanes ever, and I know I'm not alone in that. I'm sure that from now to the far distant future, there will still be plenty of us that fully appreciate the fabulous Phantom. The F-14 Tomcat is probably one of the most famous aircraft ever built, partially due to a certain movie that I, I think most of y'all have seen, just called A Hunch Here. The Tomcats were introduced in the 70s, and had a crew of two, a pilot and a radar intercept officer. They're 62 feet 9 inches long, had a wingspan of 64 feet 1 and a half inches, Unless, of course, those wings were swept back, in which case that dropped to 38 feet, 2 and a half inches. They had an empty weight of 43,735 pounds, and a maximum takeoff weight of 74,350 pounds. At altitude, they could reach a speed of Mach 2.34. That's 1,544 miles per hour, or 2,485 kilometers per hour. They had a range of 1,600 nautical miles, they could fly as high as 53,000 feet, 16,000 meters. Their armament consisted of a gun, a 20mm M61A1 Vulcan 6-barreled rotary cannon, as well as 10 hardpoints, 6 under the fuselage, 2 under nacelles, and 2 on the wing gloves, which could be equipped with a variety of rockets, missiles, and later on when they were upgraded for ground attack roles, bombs. And their introduction to service was not really a smooth ride, as you would call it. The Navy had to fight a little bit to be able to even get a plane like the Tomcat. The idea for something like the Tomcat actually dates back to the late 1950s. The United States Navy was looking for a long-range, high-endurance interceptor to defend its carrier battle groups against anti-ship missiles that were launched from jet bombers as well as submarines of the Soviet Union. It was the Cold War, after all. They were looking for a fleet air defense aircraft, with a powerful radar and longer-range missiles than the F-4 Phantom II to intercept both enemy bombers and missiles at very, very long range. Studies into that concept actually led to what was called the Douglas F-6D Missileer, which is a really weird name. Also, it was cancelled in 1961 because, well, that plane could indeed fire those missiles. It was subsonic, and it really couldn't defend itself once it had fired those. The Navy wanted something with much higher performance than that. So they opted to participate in what was known as the Tactical Fighter Experimental Program, or TFX, along with the U.S. Air Force, a program that was pushed by Robert McNamara, who was the Secretary of Defense at the time. He favored a versatile aircraft that could actually be shared by both services, which would reduce procurement and development costs. And from a financial perspective, yeah, that does make sense, but the Air Force and the Navy have very different needs from their aircraft. McNamara had already pushed the Air Force to buy the F-4 Phantom II, which was actually developed for the Navy initially. He told them not to buy any more F-105 Thunder Chiefs or F-106 Delta Darts, 
And the Air Force kind of got away with it, but as time went on, the Navy started really pushing back on this whole let's share with the Air Force thing. And it really didn't have much to do with any rivalry between them, it's just that they had different requirements. And it's hard to get a single type of plane to handle both sides of the equation here. The TFX, which would eventually become the F-111, did have pretty good speed, range, and payload, but it was designed primarily as a fighter-bomber, as well as an indictor, a type of attack aircraft or bomber that operates far behind enemy lines. So as a result, it lacked the maneuverability and overall performance the Navy was looking for. It really couldn't dogfight super well. They pushed back heavily against the TFX, as they could clearly see that because of the Air Force's need for a low-level attack aircraft, the plane would have to compromise performance as a fighter, which is what they were looking for. But at the time, their concerns were overridden, so the project went ahead. General Dynamics were the ones working on the F-111, and they actually didn't have much recent experience with naval fighters, so they started working with Grumman to provide assistance in that particular area. But even if the Navy was willing to accept the compromises, both weight and performance issues repeatedly plagued the poor F-111. And as time went on, Grumman on the side began studying improvements and alternatives to this particular plane. In 1966, the Navy actually awarded them a contract to begin studying advanced fighter designs, which Grumman would narrow down to what they called the 303. The name Tomcat would eventually be chosen, partially at least, to pay tribute to Admiral Thomas F. Connolly, who was involved in the program, and the nickname Tom's Cat had already been used to refer to it. Tell that Grumman also had a history with cats. They built the Wildcat, the Hellcat, the Tiger Cat, and the Bear Cat, and when they got the Jets, they made the Panther, Cougar, and Tiger. They just liked cats over there, is really what I'm trying to say. Experience during the Vietnam War was showing that the Phantom lacked the maneuverability needed to win consistently in a dogfight against more modern MiGs. The MiGs were agile, and the F-4s, well, I love F-4 Phantoms, but some people describe them as strapping two jet engines to a brick, and that's not too far off. They really couldn't turn as well as some of the MiGs could, and that was causing issues. So a new program, known as VFAX, was introduced to study new fighter aircraft that would either replace or supplant the Phantom in the fighter and ground attack roles, while the TFX worked on a long-range interception role. Grumman was still ironing out the 303 in the background, and did offer it to the Navy in 1967, which led to further studies. This is also about the time Connolly got involved. He was the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Air Warfare, and he flew the developmental F-111A variant, and found that it actually struggled to go supersonic, and had very poor carrier landing characteristics, which would make it very bad for the Navy for obvious reasons. He was the one who testified before Congress about this, and this testimony would convince them to stop funding for the F-111B, which was supposed to be for the Navy, and allow them to pursue an aircraft that was specifically tailored to their requirements, rather than compromise with the Air Force. The F-111 would still get built, however, and the Air Force would make use out of them, but they were never the blanket solution for all the services that had been originally envisioned. But with the Navy now freed up to actually, you know, buy something that will work for them, they ended VFAX in favor of a new design that would combine both roles that they were looking into. Now that they were free from TFX, they could actually work on a plane that was able to do both. In July of 1968, the Naval Air Systems Command issued a request for proposals for the Naval Fighter Experimental Program, or VFX. These acronyms are very confusing and very similar, I, I know, but just, just just follow me. This is a new program, not to be confused with the others. It's not VFAX, nor is it TFX. This is VFX, no A, no T, yeah. This program was asking for a tandem two-seat twin-engined air-to-air fighter with a maximum speed of Mach 2.2. They were also looking for it to have a built-in 20mm M61 Vulcan cannon, as well as secondary capabilities for close air support. The air terror missiles it should be able to use would include the AIM-54 Phoenixes, or a combination of six AIM-7 Sparrows or AIM-9 Sidewinders. Bids were actually received from General Dynamics Grumman, Ling Temco Vought, McDonnell Douglas, and North American Rockwell, 
and four of those bids included variable geometry wings. McDonnell Douglas and Grumman were actually the ones that were selected as finalists in December of 1968, and Grumman would get the contract in January of 1969. Even early on, the F-14 showed significant potential, though even its design had its own compromises, mostly because of the weight. So in order to fit all the requirements, Grumman had managed to create the largest and heaviest U.S. fighter to fly from an aircraft carrier. It was lighter than the F-111B, but it was still pretty big. But this is because they were required to carry the AWG-9 radar system, as well as the AIM-54 Phoenix missiles. The Navy seemed just happy enough to get a plane that might actually fit their requirements. They could get over it if it was a little bit big, as long as it worked. And the F-14's actual development went fairly smoothly, all things considered. In fact, the Navy was so excited about this, that they just straight up skipped the prototype phase and jumped directly to full-scale development. The reason for this is because they were afraid the project might be cancelled by a new presidential administration, and while that was a big risk, it did seem to pay off. In their defense, the Air Force did a remarkably similar thing to get to their F-15 Eagle. So I guess lightning does strike twice. You really shouldn't skip the prototype phase, but it worked here. The F-14 Tomcat first flew on December 21st, 1970, just 22 months after Grumman was given the contract, which is like record time for a new fighter development. They reached their initial operational capacity in 1973. The key design features of the F-14, well, are twofold. For one thing, their engines are spaced fairly far apart, partially to give space for armament. The other is the more clear one, which is the variable geometry wings. Their wings can actually sweep between 20 degrees and 68 degrees while in flight, and can be automatically controlled by its Central Air Data Computer, or CADC and it maintains a wing sweep at the optimum lift-to-drag ratio, as the Mach number varies. And pilots can manually override the system if they want to, depending on what kind of maneuver they're trying to pull off. That design enhanced the agility of the plane, and interestingly, the F-14 didn't have ailerons. Isn't that like a standard feature on pretty much every plane in the modern day? And yeah, it generally is, but not in the F-14's case, and that was really because of the way the wings worked. Ailerons would not be able to work effectively because of the variable geometry. So roll control was provided by wing-mounted spoilers at low speed, which were automatically disabled if the sweep angle exceeded 57 degrees, and at high speed it was controlled by the tailerons. It was a unique system, but it did work. Like with many planes, over time there were different versions of the F-14 as upgrades were added to them. The ones that had a service were the F-14A, A+, B, and D variants. In the 1990s, they were finally given air-to-ground capability, though honestly, the biggest change to them had to do with the engine. See, originally, their engines were Pratt & Whitney TF30-P-412As, which were rated at 20,900 pounds of static uninstalled thrust, which enabled them to maintain a speed of Mach 2.34, it was good. But the TF-30s were not very reliable engines. John Lehman, who was Secretary of the Navy in the 80s, told U.S. Congress that the TF-30 F-14 combination was, and I quote here, probably the worst engine airframe mismatch we have had in years. And he called the TF-30 terrible. 28% of all F-14 accidents at that point were actually attributed to the engine. The turbine blades had a habit of, well, failing, and they were extremely susceptible to compressor stalls, especially at high angles of attack, which had the potential to throw the F-14 into an unrecoverable flat spin. Oh, and at specific altitudes, exhaust produced by missile launches could also cause an engine compressor to stall, which led to the development of a bleed system that temporarily blocked the frontal in-tank ramp and reduces engine power during a missile launch, but that sounds like more of a workaround than an actual fix, if you ask me. But later they replaced the engines entirely with General Electric F110-GE-400s. The F110 was so much better in pretty much every conceivable way. Not only were they more reliable, but they were actually more powerful, giving the F-14s even more thrust, and improving their climb rate by 61%, a highly impressive increase. They were so powerful that the F-14 no longer needed to take off with afterburners, whereas the TF-30 always needed that unless they had basically no load. 
But despite these growing pains, the F-14 was generally well liked by the Navy, as well as pilots, and they got their first kills in US Navy service in 1981, on August 19th, over the Gulf of Sidra. In that engagement, two F-14s were engaged by two Libyan Su-22 fitters. The F-14s had to evade a missile and return fire, shooting down both of the fitters. Although the highest scoring F-14 pilot isn't American at all, he's Iranian. His name is Jalil Zandi, and he's credited with shooting down 11 Iraqi aircraft during the Iran-Iraq War. And yes, Iran does operate the F-14, though these days they don't have many combat-ready aircraft due to a lack of spare parts. As when we gave them the F-14, they were our allies, but after their revolution they became staunchly anti-American, even though they've been using American planes and, you know, I'm not even going to get into politics right now. The point is, Iran's the only one using the F-14s anymore, because we stopped using them about 2006. But why? Cheney. Cheney's why we can't have nice things around here. Do you not want to go to the danger zone, dick? The danger zone, yeah! I've been in the danger zone east of the Pacific Ocean, west of London, England, south of Mars, and north of hell, yeah! What happened was, the F-14D was supposed to be the definitive version of the Tomcat, but not all fleet units actually received it. They only got the Bs. The reason for this is in 1989, the then Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney, refused to approve the purchase of any more F-14Ds, and he stopped production after only 37 had been built, although they did manage to make 18 more by converting a few F-14As, which brought the grand total to 55 F-14Ds. There's also a planned upgrade to their computer software to allow them to use AIM-120 AM RAM missiles, but that was terminated to free up funding for Lantern integration. Upgrades did keep it competitive with other fighters, but Cheney stated that the F-14 was 1960s technology, and that it was a jobs program, and he was determined to replace it with a plane that was both more modern and not manufactured by Grumman. This decision affected 80,000 jobs under Grumman, their subcontractors, and support personnel. And Grumman tried to appease him. They proposed multiple different versions of what they called the Super Tomcat, which would have adapted the platform for a bunch of different roles, one of which even had thrust vectoring, which would have been pretty cool to see, but Cheney was dead set against them. Why are you the way that you are? Honestly, every time I try to do something fun or exciting, you make it not that way. I hate so much about the things that you choose to be, the Navy was basically forced to pursue the cheaper F-A-18 Super Hornet instead. The cancellation of more F-14s, plus the cancellation of the A-6F intruder variant, basically killed Grumman. It was controversial from many points of view, and eventually resulted in Northrop Corporation stepping in and acquiring Grumman to form Northrop Grumman. The F-14s the Navy had did remain in service until September 22nd, 2006, when they were officially placed into retirement. Some were scrapped, and some were sent to museums all across America, but I'm still kind of bitter about the whole thing personally, and I think a lot of us are. Like, the F-14 was a perfectly serviceable aircraft and could have been upgraded. The Navy was even interested, but Cheney was like, no, no, we're not gonna do that today because I said so. And, and you know, I understand as Secretary of Defense, he has to make a lot of hard decisions, but it feels like in this case, he just kind of hated Grumman. Like, that's just how it comes off to me. Maybe that's just my opinion, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. All I know is, everyone misses the F-14. But they had a good run. And again, they are one of the most famous aircraft in history, at least partially thanks to Top Gun and the sequel. And they'll likely remain a fan favorite for years to come. The Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird is a long-range, high-altitude, Mach 3 Plus strategic reconnaissance aircraft, and first flew on December 22nd, 1964. Looking at it, that date just, just doesn't sound right. Like, the 1960s was full of plenty of aircraft, 
that were really pushing the envelope in terms of technology at the time, but the Blackbird looks straight out of the future even now. Granted, there is a very good reason for that, as it is arguably one of the most advanced aircraft of its time, and to date there's really nothing exactly like this thing. It had a crew of two, the pilot and the reconnaissance systems officer, or RSO. They had a length of 107 feet 5 inches, a wingspan of 55 feet 7 inches, a sat at a height of 18 feet 6 inches, and their maximum takeoff weight was 172,000 pounds. The given maximum speed of the Blackbird in operation was 2,200 miles per hour at 80,000 feet, and they could fly as high as 85,000 feet. As you can imagine, developing an aircraft like this, especially in those days, was a tall order, but Lockheed proved up to the task and wound up producing one of the most sophisticated aircraft of its day, setting multiple records for air-breathing operational manned aircraft throughout its career, and developing a strong cult following that remains to this day. The SR-71 was not the first spy plane that Lockheed had been responsible for. They had developed the U-2 spy plane, which is a story in and of itself, and it was originally meant for the Central Intelligence Agency, or the CIA. But the U-2 aired on the relatively slow side, and it was known that it would be possible to make a reconnaissance aircraft that was far and away faster. So in late 1957, the CIA asked Lockheed to build what they called an undetectable spy plane. They wanted to be able to see what those dastardly communists were doing without the Soviets actually knowing we were watching them. The project was named Archangel, because the CIA are the grand masters of cool, top-secret project names, and was led by Clarence Leonard Kelly Johnson, who we mentioned last time as he was heavily involved in building the Starfighter. And it's easy to understand why he'd be involved, since he was the head of Lockheed's Skunk Works unit in Burbank, California. That's their super-de-duper top-secret element. Project Archangel began in the second quarter of 1958, and the goals highlighted were building an aircraft that would fly higher and faster than the U-2. Eleven successive designs were drafted in the span of about ten months, and the one designated A-10 was actually the frontrunner. No, not that one, but the shape of that particular design made it very vulnerable to radar detection, which was not what the CIA wanted. They were looking for stealth elements. So after a meeting with the CIA in March of 1959, the design was modified to have a 90% reduction in the radar cross-section. As a result of this, the CIA would approve $96 million, which is a little over $731 million in today's money, for a contract for Scott Works to build a dozen of the spy planes that were named A-12 on February 11th, 1960. Just a few months later, a U-2 would be shot down by the Soviets, showing that the CIA was right and that they did need a better spy plane if they were going to avoid that sort of thing in the future. The A-12 would first fly at Groom Lake, otherwise known as Area 51 in Nevada. Yeah, everything about this screams Black Project. It's phenomenal, isn't it? On April 25th, 1962. Thirteen of those were built, and two variants were actually developed, including three YF-12 interceptor prototypes and two of the M-21s, which were meant to carry drones in the 1960s. But I can't overstate how long ago this was all going on. Lockheed was really pushing the envelope here. Now, the A-12s were supposed to be powered by the Pratt & Whitney J-58 engines, but they ran into development issues, so they were initially equipped with the less powerful J-57s instead, and J-58s would become retrofitted as they became available, and did become the standard for all subsequent related aircraft, including the eventual SR-71. The A-12 would actually enter service, flying missions over Vietnam and North Korea, but they would be retired by 1968, and the cancellation had been announced December 28th, 1966, due to the fact that these aircraft, while revolutionary, were insanely expensive. The CIA was running into some budgetary issues, so they just couldn't fund them anymore. But everyone was expecting a forthcoming plane, an evolution of the A-12, that would be known as the SR-71. The Blackbird first took to the skies on December 22nd, 1964. 
The location of the first flight was appropriately a top secret one, U.S. Air Force's Plant 42 in Palmdale, California. During flight testing, the Blackbird pushed to a top speed of Mach 3.4. And that wasn't entirely surprising. The aircraft had been designed to sustain that kind of insane speed. And even the construction of this thing required some, uh, <clears throat> unusual additions. Mostly titanium. Normally, the use of titanium was limited by the costs involved, that it was an expensive material. And it was generally only utilized in other aircraft for their smaller components that would be exposed to the highest temperatures. But on the 71, that wasn't possible because the whole thing was going to be exposed to ridiculously high temperatures by flying at that speed. As such, titanium was used for 85% of the Blackbird, with the rest being polymer composite materials. To control the tremendous cost that this would involve, Lockheed would utilize a titanium alloy which actually softened at lower temperatures. But this still required them to develop new fabrication methods entirely. And they would find that washing welded titanium would require distilled water, not regular tap water, as there was a bit of chlorine in that, and that was corrosive. They also couldn't use cadmium-plated tools, as those also caused corrosion. Even just flying and controlling the Blackbirds had to be a unique practice due to the tremendous speeds. Major sections of the skin of the inboard wings were actually corrugated, not smooth. And initially, Aerodynamicists hated that idea because at face value it doesn't really make a lot of sense. If it's corrugated, wouldn't that make it harder for the air to flow over it and slow the aircraft down by producing more drag? And technically, yes, if it remained corrugated. But it didn't. See, the heat expected was so high that it would cause a smooth skin to split and curl, which would be bad. But the corrugated skin could expand vertically and horizontally, as well as allowing for increased longitudinal strength. It would effectively mold with the aircraft as the heat caused it to naturally warp. The fuselage panels were also manufactured to fit very loosely with the aircraft on the ground, Proper alignment would be achieved, again, when the airframe heated up and expanded. It would expand by a few inches, and it was the source of much frustration with ground crews, as, because it didn't fit solidly while on the ground and cold, prior to takeoff, the aircraft would actually straight up leak fuel. They didn't have a fuel sealing system either, because that wouldn't be able to handle the expansion at extreme temperatures. So fuel would spill all over the ground whenever they got taken out, and the ground crews would have to clean it up. But everything about this thing had to deal with the heat. The outer windscreen was made of quartz, and was fused ultrasonically to the titanium frame. The temperature of this windscreen on the exterior reached 600 degrees Fahrenheit, 316 degrees Celsius during a mission and cooling had to be carried out by cycling fuel behind the titanium surfaces. Oh, yeah, how did we even get enough titanium to build this thing? Well, fun fact, it was from the USSR. Yes, really. How did we convince them to give it to us? By lying, of course. We worked through several third world countries as well as bogus operations tricking the USSR into selling some titanium to these definitely not drawn by the USA companies, and then those companies would send it back to us so we could build the plane to spy on the USSR. It's hilarious, actually. But how did they even get them to go that fast? Well, that was complicated too, as you might imagine. For one thing, their air inlets were very unique. The shape involved here basically caused the air entering it to slow down to subsonic speed as it entered the engine. At the front of each inlet, there was a pointed movable cone that was called a spike, and it was locked in its full forward position on the ground and during subsonic flight. But as soon as the Blackbird went past Mach 1.6, an internal jack screw moved the spike up to 26 inches inwards and it was directed by an analog air inlet computer. That did take into account pretty much every element of the aircraft's current operation, pitch, roll, yaw, etc. Moving that spike drew the shockwave riding on it closer to the inlet until it touched just slightly inside the cowling lip. That position reflected the spike shockwave repeatedly between the spike center body and the inlet inner cow sides. 
and minimized airflow spillage. The air slowed with a final plane shockwave at entry to the subsonic diffuser. If that sounds ridiculous, it's because it kind of is, but it's also genius and very technical. And given the sheer altitude these things would be flying at, the crews could not wear a typical pilot suit. They were pressure suits that were, frankly, a lot closer to space suits than anything else. And the forces these planes were subjected to are no joke. They would literally fly themselves apart on most missions. The Air Force could only handle putting them in the air about once a week, because exceedingly often, they would return with rivets missing, or delaminated panels, or other broken pieces like the inlets that required repair or replacement. There were some cases of planes not being ready to fly again for a month. And mind you, this wasn't because they were, like, getting shot at on the regular, because they generally could avoid getting shot at. And even if they did, a typical procedure was just to, just to speed up. But when they got back on the ground, just the act of flying at the speeds was hard on them. So they needed constant attention, and that did drive up operational costs. The aircraft would fly over Vietnam, and during that time, the North Vietnamese would fire at least 800 missiles at them. None of them ever hit. The Blackbirds would also be used to spy on the USSR from the West, and that annoyed Sweden as they were trying to stay neutral in this whole situation. They actually launched Saab 37 Viggins to intercept them, but the Viggins was not really in a position to catch a 71. See, the Viggins could only hit Mach 2.1 and had a service ceiling of only 18 kilometers, so they were both slower and below the Blackbirds. The Swedish did manage to get locks on them on occasion, but that was only when approaching the Blackbirds from the front. And the problem is if they ever fired, well, they were kind of relying on the Blackbird not, like, just changing direction. During that time, there was also an incident that was kept secret for years. On June 29th, 1987, one of the Blackbirds was on a mission around the Baltic Sea to spy on Soviet postings, but then they suffered a uh, significant engine failure. And by that I mean the engine exploded. They were 20 kilometers in the sky when this happened, and they quickly lost altitude and turned 180 degrees to the left, and wind up flying over Gotland to search for the Swedish coast. This act, of course, violated Swedish airspace, and two unarmed Viggins that were on an exercise were ordered to investigate. They discovered the Blackbird, but it was obviously in distress, and the Swedish made the decision to escort the plane out to the Baltic Sea. A second round of Viggins would actually replace the first pair and bring the Blackbird into Danish airspace. The whole thing was classified for over 30 years, because multiple MiG-25s had the order to shoot down that Blackbird or force it to land, and were in the air right before the engine failed. One of those 25s did manage to get a missile lock on the Blackbird, but because she was under escort at the time, they opted not to fire. And much later, on November 28th, 2018, the four Swedish pilots that were involved in that situation were given medals by the United States Air Force. Another fun fact about the Blackbirds is that they did have three different variants, though the main one was the SR-71A, and that flew pretty much every single mission. There was the B, of which there were only two ever made, which was designed specifically as a trainer. The major difference is that there's a place for the instructor. Those variants have a weird little bulbous thing jutting out the top of them. And then there was the SR-71C, which I absolutely have to talk about because I love this poor, this poor red-headed stepchild of the SR-71 family. The C was a hybrid trainer, but she was composed of the rear fuselage of the very first YF-12A and the forward fuselage from an SR-71 static test unit. The YF-12 had been wrecked in a 1966 landing accident, and apparently the C was never quite straight and had a yaw at supersonic speeds. It doesn't seem to be quite right. It was caused by a misaligned pilot tube that was reporting a four-degree yaw that wasn't actually there. It was eventually corrected and she flew normally, though she was nicknamed, and children watching this, this is a very bad word, and if your parents are in the room, get their permission before going forward, I'll give you 10 seconds. Okay, not really, 3 seconds, 3, 2, 1. The pilots called her the bastard. That's what they called her! 
It's so horrible. But she was preserved, actually. She's one of the ones at the Hill Aerospace Museum at Hill Air Force Base, Ogden, Utah. So, hey, that's nice. Interestingly, the retirement of the Blackbird is almost as complicated as they were in and of themselves, because there was a lot of pushback regarding whether or not to retire them at all. No one had ever built a plane with the capabilities as the Blackbird had, but technology does move forward, and they were originally would wind up being retired in 1989, partially because of a view that the Air Force themselves pointed out that besides the fact that the Blackbirds were always literally the most violently expensive things in the universe to operate, but they'd kind of become redundant in their role. There were other reconnaissance methods that were now available, particularly spy satellites, but there were also other issues that were going into this. There was a lot of Pentagon politics in the background, and various officers in the military and other legislators thought that retiring the Blackbird wasn't actually a good idea at all. Despite spy satellites existing, the Blackbird still offered intelligence capabilities that none of the alternatives could actually provide in the 1990s. Part of the issue is that a lot of the people that had worked with the Blackbird initially would retire by the mid-80s, and the new generation of Air Force generals wanted to cut the budget and spend the funding on different priorities, such as the B-2 Spirit, which admittedly is an also amazing aircraft. And those newer generals pushed the viewpoint that the Blackbird had been completely replaced by other alternatives, when in reality that wasn't really quite right. It was more of a sales pitch to Congress, rather than actual truth. And it seems more that these generals were using the Blackbird as kind of a bargaining chip to ensure the survival of a lot of their other projects. And eventually the final squadron of SR-71s would be retired, finally shutting down operations in mid-1990. With many of the aircraft being sent to static display locations, to be fair, in various museums, and a few being kept in reserve storage. Which is deeply relevant because the SR-71 Blackbird was actually reactivated. Congress re-examined them in 1993 due to escalating situations in the Middle East and North Korea. It was found that the better-than successor of the SR-71 hadn't actually been developed, and Lockheed would bring three of the planes back into service. But the Air Force actually kind of resisted this, they hadn't budgeted for operating the Black Hawk, and again, they were very expensive to do, and UAV developers worried that their programs would suffer if money was shifted to support these things. Plus, Congress wasn't actually making it any easier, as part of the agreement was that they would do a yearly reaffirmation of the program, but that meant long-term planning for the Blackbirds was basically impossible. In 1996, the Air Force did claim that specific funding hadn't actually been authorized and pushed to ground the whole thing. Congress reauthorized the funds, but in October of 1997, then-President Bill Clinton attempted to use the line item veto to cancel that. In June of 1998, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the line item veto was actually unconstitutional, so he, he, he couldn't actually do that. But all this political nonsense left the Blackbird's status uncertain until September of 1998, and the planes were permanently retired that same year. NASA would wind up operating the last two airworthy Blackbirds until 1999, as they were incredibly useful for their own research, given they could fly almost literally at the edge of space. And for what it is worth, all the Blackbirds that didn't suffer cataclysmic accidents were moved to museums, except for two that were retained by NASA. Speculation still exists regarding the SR-71 successor, the daughter of the Blackbird, if you will. The SR-72 was reported to be being made at Lockheed Skunk Works back on November 1st, 2013, and apparently it would fly twice as fast as the original Blackbird at Mach 6, which would be really impressive, but there's two things to consider here. For one thing, officially, the Air Force is pursuing a Northrop Grumman RQ-180 UAV to assume the Blackbird's role. And even if Lockheed does come out with the SR-72, it is also going to be a UAV. It's an unmanned vehicle, which, I mean, I understand why the military pushes for those, because they don't put pilots in harm's way. But I guess when you do that, you kind of lose some of the magic, you know? 
Part of the reason the Blackbirds are so glorious is not only the facts that they were way ahead of their time, that they're just absolutely gorgeous, that they're blindingly fast, they can fly ridiculously high, but they also took people with them to accomplish these things. But in the modern day, it is unlikely we'll ever see a Blackbird fly again. They'll remain on static display, which admittedly isn't the worst end for them. They can still be enjoyed by museum goers and still be fondly loved by their fans. And perhaps one day, whether she's a drone or not, the daughter of the Blackbird will light up the sky once again, like a candle in the infinite darkness of space. For the candles in the darkness, burning up the sorrow, they 